This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosting an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at virginiarodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and again a special thanks to the Sorensen Leadership Class 2013 for helping to provide some of the questions that we'll be asking statewide candidates. But today a very special welcome to Mark Obenshane, first elected to the Senate 10 years ago, been That's elected right. three times yep. in the midst of your current four-year term from the Shenandoah Valley, from Harrisonburg, Rockingham County. In the Senate of Virginia, you chair the Privileges and Elections Committee, serve on Commerce and Labor, as well as Rules and Courts. Don't forget Agriculture. Oh, and Agriculture, too. Yes, that's important to not only the Valley, but to the Commonwealth. Absolutely. It is. But we're not here today so much to talk about your role in the Senate, but to talk about your, your current election that you're working toward in November, and that is to to serve the Commonwealth as Attorney General. So what we'd like for you to do to start is to talk with the viewers some and tell them about yourself. I've just given them some of the technical parts, but tell them more you bet. and tell them why you're running for Attorney General. You bet. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's great to be with you and uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk to you about some of these issues and, uh, and I appreciate that broad opening first. You know, I grew up in Richmond. I grew up in a very political environment and uh, an household, as a matter of fact. Uh, my uh, family was involved in politics, and I grew up in the 1960s and 1970s when, you know, for a Republican running for statewide office in Virginia, you couldn't run the red flag up the flagpole and ask people to vote for me because I'm a Republican and expect to win. You really had to reach out and cross a lot of lines, reach out and, and connect with independents, with Democrats, and with Republicans. And by building that kind of a coalition, we could win. And uh, over the course of my 10 years in the General Assembly, I've looked for opportunities to build those coalitions. I've worked with folks like Cree Deeds and Johnny Joanno on property rights, uh, David Bulova uh, on human trafficking, and uh, some of the bills that we've really enjoyed the most success on have been bills that have uh, enjoyed bipartisan support. You know, I grew up in uh, in Richmond. I went to college and law school west of the Blue Ridge Mountains. I settled in uh, the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia where I practiced law for 26 years. I was managing partner of a firm with about nearly 70 employees. Uh, I left in order to run for the Senate back in 2003 and founded a second law firm that we've grown to about 50 employees in two cities in Harrisonburg and Charlottesville. And uh, I've uh, enjoyed immensely the practice of law. I've enjoyed my public service in the General Assembly. And I see two real challenges that I really want to focus on as Attorney General. Number one 
is making sure that we keep our communities safe. And uh, I think that is the most fundamental part of the job of Attorney General and uh, in working with law enforcement and uh, in uh, some of the bills I've worked on in the General Assembly, I feel particularly well equipped to do that. And then second is making sure that we have a, the Attorney General has a role to make sure that our economy continues to remain strong, that we continue to be a job magnet here in Virginia, that we adopt policies that encourage economic growth. And again, I think that my experience equips me for that. I, I want to run the one of the largest law firms in Virginia. Uh, I think that the Attorney General's office is certainly the most important law firm in Virginia. And uh, as a uh, longtime practicing lawyer and manager of law firms, uh, I'm looking forward to the challenges of being the people's lawyer here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Well, thank you for laying that out. You, you know I'm not an attorney, so I started looking in the Constitution and then the code to try to figure out, you know, what what might I ask you and, and the other person, the other Mark who's running for Attorney General about the role of the Attorney General. I found in the Constitution this sentence, he shall perform such duties and receive such compensation as may be prescribed by law. I looked in the code and I found over a thousand references and more than 500 documents, but then I found, again, the Attorney General shall be the Chief Executive Officer of the Department of Law, which you referred right. to, and shall perform such duties as may be provided by law. You, you laid out some of what you were saying the role of the Attorney General is, so it's, it's really broad in what is said in the Constitution, as you would understand even better than I, and in the Code, so uh, I, I think our viewers probably have a better understanding of the role of Governor they may have an understanding that the lieutenant governor provides, presides over the Senate, but then when it comes to attorney general, they may be saying, okay, tell us some more. Exactly, you're in charge of this big law firm. What does the law firm do? Well, great question. And uh, the uh, attorney general of Virginia is really is the lawyer for every department, agency, board, and commission within the state government. Uh, the really important part of the role of attorney general is to be a good lawyer. Uh, to be a uh, good advisor, to be a good counselor to uh, your client, which is the state government of Virginia. And the uh, state government has many complex uh, legal issues which cross the waterfront from public safety to uh, uh, contracting to employment uh, to uh, just basically general representation of complex uh, entities. Uh, but when you talk to people across Virginia, one of the things that they view as most fundamental to the job of the uh, Attorney General is keeping our community safe. Uh, one of the primary functions uh, in those black books is that uh, the Attorney General is charged with defending uh, basically every criminal appeal in the Commonwealth of Virginia, also with some uh, prosecutorial responsibilities. And uh, you know and I know that every year the Attorney General plays an important role in uh, coming to the General Assembly, working with the public safety community in proposing uh, modifications to our criminal law to make sure that we're keeping up with the changing challenges of uh, uh, criminal enterprises and uh, criminal uh, challenges we have across the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, that's an important part of the role. Another important part is uh, when Virginia law or Virginia constitutional provisions are challenged, it's the Attorney General of Virginia who steps in and has to defend those challenges. And uh, you know, that's, uh, that is a responsibility that has to be performed. I mean, it's not optional when a lawsuit is filed. We can't basically substitute our judgment for that of the General Assembly and uh, decline uh, the invitation to defend a lawsuit challenging uh, constitutional provisions. We've got two lawsuits pending right now. Uh, one over our photo ID bill. And I know that uh, there is a difference of opinion over whether it was a good policy choice. But it's up to a judge to decide whether or not that should uh, succeed or fail, not the Attorney General to de uh, decline to defend it. I'm going to defend that provision also. One and a half million Virginians uh, nearly uh, voted for uh, an amendment to our Constitution, our marriage amendment. And I know that also is a hotly contest contested uh, policy issue. But the job of the Attorney General 
I, and both my opponent and I voted for the marriage amendment. Presumably, we both believed it was constitutional when it passed. And so our job is to defend it. I, I've made it clear that I'm going to do that job. And I think that's something that, uh, I, that uh, is an important part of the role. Is there another uh, matter, not yet maybe a lawsuit, but pertaining to transportation? And uh, that, that could that could come before the where the attorney general would be called on to defend the law that was enacted by the general assembly signed by the governor. Yeah, very very good question, and uh, you know it is uh, not just uh, bills that I may have supported as a uh, member of the general assembly. That's my job to defend, but also bills that I may have opposed and. Uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, transportation bill several years ago uh, was challenged in the Supreme Court of Virginia. The Attorney General's job was to defend it and did, and, and frankly, the Supreme Court struck down that law. Uh, this year, maybe no different. We uh, passed landmark uh, transportation legislation. Uh, the, there have been suggestions made that there's going to be a challenge to that. And if there is, as um, uh, Attorney General, I would vigorously and aggressively defend it, uh, and it is my job to do that, uh, to uh, zealously defend uh, uh, a bill of that nature, which I would have no hesitation to do. Are there, uh, and I haven't, I didn't go through all those uh, 570 documents, so that would have taken more time than I wanted to spend <laughs> digging through the code, but are there, are there matters pertaining to ethics? And I'm not seeking to bring up current issues that people are well aware of right now, but matters pertaining to ethics where the Office of the Attorney General gets involved, where, where you would be involved as the head of that Department of well, Law? Well, let me, let me say that uh, there is certainly, anybody who's read the newspaper, watched television, knows that there are uh, questions concerning, if nothing else, what are we going to do in the future? concerning some of our ethics laws. I've made a proposal to uh, place a cap on, uh, on gifts for elected officials, whether you're governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, member of the General Assembly, and I've proposed capping uh, gifts at $100 per year and applying that to members of elected officials' households. And uh, I think that that's important. Voters of Virginia uh, really do expect people to serve in these elected offices to serve their communities, uh, not to uh, uh, personally enrich themselves. And I think that's a, a reasonable uh, uh, approach. I've also made it clear that as Attorney General, whether these uh, changes are adopted or not, we'll abide by it and we'll impose those restrictions on the Attorney General's office. But more importantly than that, uh, or in addition to that, I've also indicated that the Attorney General's office, I do believe, has an important role in making sure that, uh, that across uh, the state government that we uh, have a government uh, comprised of officials elected and otherwise who understand the ethics laws. And that's always an important part of the role of a counselor, is making sure that your client is aware of the law and how to comply with it. And uh, I think that it's going to be important for the Attorney General's Office to offer uh, ethics uh, uh, training across the, uh, the waterfront in uh, uh, providing services as general counsel to the Commonwealth of Virginia. You know, as an attorney, you're obligated to take certain courses and maybe refreshers in matters such as ethics. And, and, and as I was I, used, I, I searched the word ethics in the Code of Virginia, and I don't remember how many times it appears, but it was interesting that, it, that people, in, uh, whether it's in real estate or here or there and yonder, that required to maybe at a certain frequency to take a refresher course. Sure. And, and I guess in light of, of uh, issues, it, it sounds like that would be good for elected officials, whether or not they're attorneys. Well, it's a matter of uh, making sure that people are aware of what their obligations right. are and what the pitfalls right. are. As a practicing lawyer, we have to uh, uh, fulfill mandatory continuing legal education requirements, which include a minimum number of ethics hours that we take every year. In my role as uh, 
a, a lawyer with my two uh, law firms. I've been ethics officer for uh, both firms at times, and uh, I have been responsible for ensuring compliance with uh, our ethics rules. And legal ethics rules uh, are uh, not exactly the same as, as governmental ethics rules, and we've just got to make sure that people uh, throughout the government understand what those obligations are. Uh, and that's a, that's a large part of compliance, is just making sure that they know what the rules are. You know, one of the, the hot issues of the past session, and it's still under, uh, I might say, study here in Virginia, has to do with Medicaid expansion. Um, I would understand your role, if you serve as Attorney General, would be different from the role you have currently as, as a Senator. but. Do you have a perspective on that issue that you've shared with the people of the Commonwealth about? Sure, and uh, you know when you talk about Medicaid expansion, it is uh, really bound up in the debate over the Affordable Care Act and whether right. that's the right direction for the nation to be headed in reforming our health care system. I completely agree that we have an access to health care problem. Nobody mm -hmm. uh, would dispute that issue. The question is, how do we expand access to health care? And uh, I have uh, not taken the same view of the, as the President and the administration in Washington as to how best to tackle that problem uh, and have not uh, supported the expansion. But uh, as Attorney General, my job is not going to be to cast a vote in the General Assembly. My job is not going to be to make those policy decisions, but when those policy decisions are made, my job is going to be to make sure that the, um, that the policy that is chosen is implemented in a manner consistent uh, with state and federal law, and uh, to make sure that we are uh, doing it in the appropriate way. So I understand the uh, difference in the role of an attorney general as opposed to a legislator, and that's a, that's a role that I transition that I make every year. When I leave Richmond, I can't go and uh, tell my clients in the private sector, uh, don't worry about that law, it's a bad law. I disagree with it and you don't have to comply with it. Uh, my clients have to comply with it whether it is a uh, law that I agree with or not. I'm not going to check my opinions at the, uh, uh, at the door, but I certainly understand my professional obligations are to implement uh, the policy decisions that are made by uh, General Assembly and to a certain extent uh, uh, governor in the administration. You know there's oftentimes discussion about the size and role of government and whether things could be right-sized or could be changed. As you reflect on that and even thinking for a moment of putting on the hat of, of Attorney General, um, have you had a chance yet to, to look at that law department? Uh, is, is it right-sized? I mean always looking for cuts, you and practically every one of your colleagues saying if, if there's something we can cut because it's taxpayer money, then we should cut it. And, I, and I'm wondering, is, is, is that an area that... Yeah, you know, you've always got to uh, be engaged in an ongoing analysis of whether or not we are uh, overstaffed, understaffed, uh, whether we have the, uh, the uh, personnel necessary to meet our obligations. One area in which the Attorney General's office has uh, had an awful lot of work over the course of, I guess, the past four, eight, twelve years has been in, um, in uh, pursuing uh, Medicaid fraud, and uh, um, and and that has uh, been an area in which, you know, basically, we've deployed a a, ta uh, a group that has actually brought significant money into the Commonwealth. And you know, you look at downsizing. You've got to look at downsizing in a smart way that doesn't diminish our ability to perform our mission. And uh, you know, I'm not going to say that. Uh, that uh, the Attorney General's office is either overstaffed or understaffed. What I'm going to do is walk into that office and, uh, and uh, be engaged in an ongoing evaluation of the adequacy of the size of the staff and look for duplication, but also look for areas in which we're not able to adequately pursue justice, which is the uh, role of the Attorney General's office. You know, the, uh, the Dillon rule often comes up, uh, does the Attorney General get involved 
and, and that at all in trying to determine whether whether localities have certain rights or when, when that's not clear? Well, the most frequent uh, opportunity the Attorney General has to weigh into that issue is when local governments uh, or members of the General Assembly ask the Attorney General for opinions right. about uh, whether or not the uh, actions of local governmental bodies or proposed actions are going to comply with state law. The Dillon Rule is uh, a rule that basically says that we have one government in Virginia, uh, that is the state government, but the separate political subdivisions uh, have powers uh, under that are, are granted to them by the General Assembly and, uh, um, and no more. Uh, and that's important to maintaining our competitive business environment in Virginia. It would be incredibly difficult for businesses navigating uh, our uh, set of laws here in Virginia if they had to navigate uh, a different set of laws for each locality around Virginia. And uh, that's something that I certainly support. I support maintaining the Dillon Rule. Uh, it's not to say that we d shouldn't look uh, annually at whether we need to alter the uh, set of powers and duties of local governments around Virginia, but I think that we need to make sure that uh, we are uh, maintaining that uh, competitive advantages, advantage in claiming the economic benefit uh, that comes from having the Dillon Rule in Virginia. One other subject, uh, redistricting, um, obviously comes up every decade after the census, sometimes comes up in between with, with tweaking or other, other changes. Um, is, is this something that the Attorney General might be involved in, um, in redistricting, or does the Attorney General have, 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 have his own bully pulpit as the governor and others do with regards to redistricting? No. Well, first of all, let me make it clear that uh, I have supported and continue to support a, uh, a redistricting commission. I'd, to the extent yes. possible, I'd really like to see uh, the uh, politics taken out of redistricting. Uh, second of all, the Attorney General's office does have a role in redistricting, as you're well aware. Uh, it is not uncommon for there to be legal challenges to redistricting uh, plans that have been adopted. And uh, when there are challenges, it is the responsibility of the Attorney General to defend uh, the plans as adopted and uh, to defend the Commonwealth in uh, those legal actions. So the Attorney General's office may very well uh, be engaged in uh, providing legal advice during the process. and also in uh, sorting out the uh, legal disputes that may arise following the adoption of redistricting plans or tweaks. You know, o over quite a few elections, Virginians have elected a Republican Attorney General, even when they elected a Democrat to one of the other statewide offices. With, with all of those Attorney Generals, Attorneys General out there, it, are, are there those that you would uh, want to emulate some aspect of, of their? A great question. And first of all, I'd like to, I'm sure you agree with me that that's been a good trend, but. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> stay, I'll stay neutral. <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> right. But uh, yes, absolutely. You know, I mentioned I grew up in Richmond, and I look at, uh, at the attorney generals that I remember, and I really do take something from different attorney generals. I look at Jerry Blyles, and the uh, sense of professionalism and the business-like approach he brought to the Attorney General's office that is still there in, in the office. I look at Jerry Kilgore and Jim Gilmore and their focus on keeping our community safe and uh, putting an emphasis on public safety. I look at Bob McDonnell and uh, the emphasis he placed on regulatory reform and review. And uh, then I look at Ken Cuccinelli, who's been Attorney General during a period in which we've had an adjustment uh, in the relationship between the states and the federal government. And uh, he has uh, certainly uh, had a role in, uh, in making that adjustment. And I look at, uh, at each of those characteristics, and those are each characteristics that I admire from each of those attorney generals, Republican and Democrat. And, uh, I, and uh, I'm somebody who's going to come into the office with my own style my own priorities and uh, my own way of administering the office. But I'm, I'm going to take uh, cues from 
each of those uh, uh, who have uh, gone before and look for best practices and, uh, um, and uh, uh, attempt to uh, run that office in a strong tradition that uh, Virginians really come to expect. Great way to end the program and appreciate that. I hope your website has been up. If not, we want to make sure that markobenchain.com is up here at the close, that people can go on, can read more about your, your positions. But again, thank you so much for being on This Week in Richmond. David, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosting an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at VirginiaRodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.